Uh, well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this special John Schofield Trust Masterclass session. It started as one story about conditions in a couple of flats in a tower block in Croydon. The pictures were so appalling that it led News at 10 that night and shocked not only the audience, but the journalists who worked on it. From there, ITV News were deluged with stories of similar scandals elsewhere. There was a parliamentary inquiry and it turned into an unprecedented TV news campaign by ITV News that is still continuing four months later. Tonight, we'll see some really incredible extracts from the coverage and we'll hear from the people who put it all together, including the woman whose story and experience started it all off. Before that, a few words about the John Schofield Trust. We're very lucky that all of the speakers today, like all of the speakers in our Masterclass series, have offered their valuable time for free. The Schofield Trust, which works to make the news industry inclusive, is a small charity, and we run these Masterclasses for free too. But as we're a small charity, we would ask that you consider donating if you can. A QR code will appear on your screen, it is there now. Please scan it if you can with a phone QR code reader and consider donating. Or you can text Schofield to 70085. Um, won't make any recommendations about amounts. Some people have donated 20 pounds, some 10, some a fiver. So please do give what you can afford to support our efforts. We'll leave that there for another couple of seconds before we start. Okay, <clears throat> now let me introduce our panel. First off, a particular welcome to Francois Hewitt. Francois is the mother of two young boys who's done a variety of jobs over the past 10 years. She fought tirelessly to improve her family's housing whilst living in Regina Road in Croydon. Francois said she didn't really trust journalists or even, to be honest, really know what they did until the TV news expose. But now she'd like to become one and is planning on producing a podcast in the months ahead. Welcome, Francois. Sarah Thank you. Sarah O'Connell is a freelance investigative journalist and filmmaker who's worked for BBC News, Al Jazeera, Sky News and ITN and others. Most of her work has focused upon criminal justice, violence against women and girls and poverty. She says she's a firm believer that journalists should comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable and she does that very effectively. Daniel Hewitt is a political correspondent for ITV News. His work on child poverty in the north of England was nominated for the Orwell Prize and won an RTS award uh, in 2018. He's currently investigating the UK housing crisis and the impact on tenants of poor, dangerous living conditions. Imogen Barra is the head of investigations and special projects at ITV News, where her role is to drive original and longer term journalism. Her story highlights include undercover investigations into gay conversion therapy and London's sex slave industry, exposing allegations of sexual misconduct at Scotland's biggest ballet school, Ballet West, and most recently, the exposure on the expose rather of Amazon's waste disposal practices. And Imogen leads ITV's News's small but passionate housing team. Okay, now let's start things off with Francois. We're going to see your flat for ourselves in a few minutes, but can you tell us a little bit about what life was like there for you and your family? Yes, um, living at Regina Road, um, life there was basically, it was me and the two boys and just making use of what we really had. Um, it wasn't in the best conditions, but we never had any other choice but to stay in those conditions because no matter how many times, we asked the council and the repairs team to make changes or to do repairs. It just never happened. Yeah. Sarah, so, how did you get to get to come in touch with Francois? So Dan had called me um, a few weeks before I met Francois, mad keen on covering housing stories. And we'd sort of agreed, the three of us, me, Imogen and Dan, that we would start off by looking at asylum seekers and housing and, and for mums and families in poor housing. So I was in another HMO in Croydon and met um, a friend of Francois and she told me, Chantal, one of Francois' friends said, you need to go down and see my friend. She's in a terrible state. She's so stressed. She's got a really bad leak. 
you need to go down and see her. And to be honest, at the time, I wasn't even sure if we could feature Francois because it wasn't the spec that we were looking for. But I could see from a friend that she was in dire straits. So I asked her, told her, get this girl to get in touch with me. And then I got an email of Francois about 24 hours later, she emailed me really fast. And yes. I just went down, I liaised with her and then I went down. And uh, we're going to have a look now at some of the extracts from that first video that you shot um, when you went to see Francois' flat. So we'll have a look at that now. Just a warning that Zoom technology can be a touch tricky, particularly with me operating it. So please bear in mind, bear uh, with me if there's a slight delay. Here we go. Let's have a look at that now. So this is my kitchen. Um, I live on Seven Regina Road, Croydon, the council house. Um, this is my kitchen. It's got mould from ceiling to floor. Um, the walls is very moist and wet. As you can see, there's water on the ceilings. There's water on the walls. Um, so if if I show you the cook, behind the cooker in the pieces, there's mould. There's mould on the plugs. It's moist. It's wet. So it's it's not just mould. It's dangerous because everywhere is wet. Electricals, everything. My cupboards, mould, mould in my cupboards, mould everywhere. My cupboards are all mould up. My plates, everything is just ruined. Like I don't even go in these cupboards because. I've been in there before and slugs came out on me and that was just not going to try that again. It's been What's leaking that? through here so that's the water that's been collecting from the ceiling. I can't afford to put a lot of buckets in here so um, this is the water that's been collected from the ceiling and the lights. Um, as you can see over here there is more mould and damp is just leaking there as well coming down into around these areas. Sorry. So just in there, it's leaking in there as well, the pipes and um, moulded. There's a big crack in my floor due to all of the water that's been getting soaked up into the flooring. So it's just rised it and they'll burst it open. In my uh, food cupboard, okay. I cannot store anything or use it anymore as it's just molded up and damp and wet in there. I've had to take out some stuff because they got so soaked and wet. I mean, stuff that I haven't used gifts for my kids. This is a doorway coming out of the kitchen. As you can see, it's leaking from the ceiling in the doorway in front of the fridge. Um, I've got two children, two boys, and my eldest was um, basically walking, coming around, and he slipped on the water. He was he ripped his toenail because it wasn't this bad at the time. He ripped his toenail. I phoned social service to report it and basically they told me to just record down everything and if anything happens then at least I have record of what's happening. Coming out of the kitchen now, I've had to turn off my fridge for at least a good three months now because water has been leaking on it, over it, everywhere at the back, through the electrical. So I've had to turn it off because the electrical, so people that came out from the council basically said it was safer for me to just not use it. Who so came out from the council out. and said An that? An electrician. So I, the lights cut out completely because of all of the water that kept going in the electricals. So I had to ring the council to tell them I don't have any light. So they sent an electrician out and they basically then cut off where the problem is coming from. My carpet has been soaked. As you can see, you're walking on it. There's just water coming out of the rug because of the water coming from the ceiling and from the walls and everywhere everything has just been getting soaked okay um sarah what did you think when you saw the condition of that flat what did i think um <clears throat> i was horrified as any sane normal compassionate person would and I probably go into a lot of crummy housing. It's not something that I don't do. You know, I see a lot of um, bad housing, but what kind of shocked me more almost was Francois, um, who was clearly beside herself with despair. And I wouldn't go so far as to say she'd given up, um, but she, she was just at a wit's end. 
and and that was equally shocking to me as well that not only was she living in this state of disrepair but that she just could not find any anyone to help her and so I was shocked on two different levels. Um, Imogen what was your reaction when Sarah brought you that video and, and how did you and the ITV News judge the importance of, and the weight of that story? Yeah I remember um, Sarah calling me actually and saying I've just been to this house and you'll never believe I've never seen the conditions I've never seen conditions like it and we had been as Sarah said we've been looking for a few weeks um, at housing and we'd kind of a week before we'd found something or Sarah had found something that we thought would be really good uh, and they told their landlord that we were coming around to film and they quickly tidied it up repaired it and so when Sarah called me to say look I found this place we were like well let's not do that again let's just send Dan let's go straight down there um, and I remember when Dan first went and you know as the as the editor you kind of wait for your correspondent or reporter to call you and tell you how it went and like how good the how good the filming was and he just called me and he said I'm just shaking with rage. I'm absolutely furious. I've never seen anything like this in my life. Um, and we just have to do this, you know, straight away. Because we were looking for a bigger picture story. We were looking for something, but actually, you know, this this thing was right in front of us. So, um, and then when we kind of wanted to turn it into a piece, it was how do we do that? How do we have such shocking pictures? Do we need something bigger? Or can we, you know, as the national news, or can we actually just tell the story of, Franzoy and Leroy and what they're going through in Regina Road um, and that conversation began in our newsroom of, of how we get this on, how we tell the story and what happens. Uh, Dan, how did you get involved and what were your thoughts at that first stage of the story? Um, oh, Sarah said it really, I, I, I sort of just before Christmas um, um, I had an idea for looking at people living over the Christmas period um, in poverty poor housing what life would be like life's been pretty bad for everyone but how bad could life get if if you've been living in poor housing and then obviously me and sarah started talking and actually on the day that we went to see franzoi we'd actually in the afternoon agreed to go to another um set of flats over in thurrock and so we had morning croydon that was the plan and in the afternoon in thurrock and i arrived and i'd ne actually never met sarah in person we spoke on the phone but sarah sort of met me outside and said sort of brace yourself for this. I know you've seen the video, but it's really bad. And when I went in, I just, it's funny when you played that video back, I haven't watched that initial video for a really long time. And I, it actually, rage is the word Imogen used. And I was, it's absolutely the same actually. That it was, it was just the sense that when Franz always kept saying, oh, people have been in to see that. And oh, the electrician told me to turn that off. And oh yeah, they said that. And I just couldn't get my head around the fact that people had been in, that people had seen that. I mean, I just wanted to scoop Franzoi and her children and just take, literally take them home with me. I just couldn't bear the idea they would spend a second longer in there. But when you know that she spent months and months in there and Franzoi had said something to me when we were there. I don't know if you remember this, Franzoi, but you said that at Christmas, on Christmas Day, you would feed the children Christmas dinner and that it was leaking so badly from the ceiling that your child, your son had sat eating Christmas dinner with an umbrella over him. And I just wanted to burst into tears. I just, I just couldn't. I couldn't fathom that anyone could be left to live like that. And so, yeah, Imogen's right, I rang her. And I just basically, for the whole day, just kept ringing Imogen and saying, you can have a million meetings about this. We're not doing another story. This is the story. This is bad. This is the worst you're going to see. Um, and yeah, and so we knocked on doors. Me and Sarah went knocked on some doors in the flat and found Leroy and we found more people living like that. Some people didn't want to be on camera, but we found some pretty bad conditions. And and yeah, it went from there. If you could, if you could bottle um, Franzoy's resilience and courage and fearlessness and determination you'd be a very rich man I can tell you. Okay we'll come to Francois very shortly but let's just for the moment have a look at what you did with the story as the lead on News at 10. I think it led at uh, 6.30 uh, as well but it certainly led News at 10 and made a, a real impact. Let's have a look at that now. Good evening. What we're about to show you in our first report tonight should be unthinkable in 21st century Britain, the Britain of levelling up where no one should be left behind. Our pictures from inside a block of flats in Croydon in South London shock the experts who the government turned to after the Grenfell fire to review building safety. She believes the state of the flats is the worst she has ever seen. You may be inclined to agree. Dame Judith Hackett says four years on from Grenfell, people in high rise buildings are still being ignored. The head of shelter thinks 
The same, and the threat this time isn't from fire, but water, damp, destroying everything in its path. Possessions, peace of mind, health. The tenants have been asking the council to do something for months. One of them thinks there is a racist dimension to the delay in fixing the problems. No one should have to live in conditions like this. But in this wet, cold, mould-infested flat live Franzoy and her two young sons. The bath she once used to bathe her children catches dirty water from the ceiling above. The leaks began four months ago, soaking the floors, destroying their possessions and turning their home into a health hazard. I've had to plug out my fridge since like for about three months now because um, water has been leaking down the back of it into the electric plug and um, it shutted off all the electrics. The damp began two years ago, but despite complaining to her landlord, Croydon Council, for the past four months, nothing has been done. I mean, there's only so much I can get angry and get upset and pull my hair out. It's, I just feel like I'm going to kill myself if I continue like that. So I just try not to make it stress me out too much. You've got two children living here, Yes, then. I do. What do they say to you about this? Mummy, the house is flooding and are we going to move? Are they going to fix our house? And they're like, oh, are we going to be homeless? What do you say to them? I, so, I told them the truth. I said, I don't know if anyone's going to fix it. And maybe we will be homeless because everybody I turn to, no one helps. So. This is the room that we're all living in. The only part of the flat undamaged is the bedroom so where Franzoy and her sons play, sleep and eat and keep what belongings they have left. I had to move the microwave out of the kitchen and the kettle because obviously it's the only way I could probably make some noodles or yeah. warm up something. Do you worry about the kids' health? Yes, I do worry about our health. My youngest, I have to be using Vicks and vapor rubs at night because he can't breathe because he's so stuffed up. On the next floor up, we find the same problems in a different flat where Leroy is living. Because the mould is everywhere. I've had to move the furniture around so that the, the water doesn't land on the bed. This is all, this is all mould? This is all mould. It looks, it, looks like, it looks like there's been a fire. It's terrible. Leroy has had damp problems here for many years, but in November, the leaking began all over his flat, sparing not a single room. How long you had these four buckets here for? Since about Christmas. Every six hours, I emptied them and uh, put them back out again. So what do you do at night? I go to bed about 12, wake up about six, empty the buckets. Like Franzoy downstairs, Leroy feels ignored by Croydon Council. I have to keep on ringing the council over and over again to say, what are you doing about this leak in my flat? Eventually they said to me, there's no leak in your flat. They said there's no leak in this flat? They said there's no leak in this flat. Why do you think they're not listening to you? I've got a feeling, because when I used to ring up before, I used to say, Leroy, my name's Leroy McNally. And I've got a feeling that that puts them on the off foot, because straight away they say, Leroy, it's a black person, we don't want to deal with this person, blah, blah. I got a feeling it's something like that. Eventually, I started saying my name's Mr. McNally. I wouldn't say Leroy. And I got a better response. So you got a better response when you didn't use your Christian name? When I didn't use my Christian name. And it's not just Leroy's flat or Franzoy's flat. We've spoken to several residents in this block who say they've experienced damp, mould, leaks and flooding in the time that they've lived here. To assess the potential danger of living in these flats, it's the worst I've ever seen we invited an independent environmental hygienist to carry out an inspection. We've got a really, really high risk of electrocution here. Really? This is the sort of flat that I would have expected to see in a rundown area in the 1970s. We showed what we found in this South London tower block to the expert who led the review into building safety after the Grenfell fire. I don't think I've ever seen anything that bad. 
She told us that the culture of how people in tower blocks in Britain are treated isn't changing fast enough. When I talk to residents in the wake of, the, of, of Grenfell, when I talk to residents in other tower blocks as part of my review, one of the common complaints from residents was nobody listens to us. And that, I'm afraid, is typical. And that's, the, that's one of the kind of fundamental cu cultural issues we've got to get over. But here, that feels like a losing battle. I feel just neglected. I just don't even feel like I'm human, like. And just how many others across Britain are tonight still being ignored. Uh, amazing to see those pictures. Uh, Francois, what did you think when you saw your life leading ITV news bulletins like that? I couldn't believe it when I was watching it on the news and I saw um, the, the video and um, I thought, I, I cannot actually believe that it took the news to get a response from the council after suffering for so long. All it took was literally a news clip and that was it. Um, can I just ask you, I, I just uh, wanted to pick up on that point that Leroy made about there being a racial element to that. H have you felt that? No, I have not felt that with them, but I do, um, I can see where he's coming from with that because a lot of black um, ethnic people live in those tower blacks on Regina Road. Yeah. Um, Dan, what, what was the reaction to the broadcast of that first story? Um, it's the biggest reaction to a story I've ever done. Um, and you always, I work in Westminster and you sort of have the, uh, the sort of the, we have the sort of the bubble test. If stuff, if stuff starts, you start to get texts and WhatsApp and calls from friends and family, you know, it's sort of like had an impact. That was just kind of off the scale, people getting in contact um, in Twitter and personally, and I know Imogen and Sarah, it was the same. And um it's what started the whole investigation, really, because it was that it was the sheer weight of the reaction from people. Firstly, just the amount of people that got in touch to say, how can I help Franzoi? That was the first point. But also there was the second point, which was people getting in touch saying, I live in a flat with a leak and damp and mold. And I and, and, and please, can you listen to me? And I think what Franzoi's point about it took a news organisation to, to kind of get this highlighted. I think that's it. for some people, they're kind of clocked on to the fact that actually they might have a bit of hope. And for a lot of people, they spend years complaining and years raising these issues and they don't go anywhere. And I think for a lot of people, they saw an opportunity to say, look, actually someone is listening to us and it's absolutely appalling and we should not be playing that role at all. But it became quite apparent that that's the role we were about to start to play, I think. Uh, Imogen, I think we all know that quite often after a story like that, even one as, as big as that, uh, quite often in a newsroom, there might be one follow-up, maybe a, a couple of them, and then a news organisation would move on to something else. What, why didn't that happen in this case? So I think um, a number of factors. I mean, there was the strength of the story itself. And as Dan says, the reaction that we had, you know, with, with just people emailing us in with their stories and their homes um, and the reaction that we have from that. But also we, um, I don't want to say we're really lucky because it should be a given, but our whole newsroom really bought into this story, you know, from the very beginning uh, when we were putting the piece out, you know, from our editor, you know, all the way down to everyone um, were really behind it. And there was a real buy-in from program editors to put it on, you know, people wanted it for their lead programs on Evening News and News at 10. Um, and there was, you know, it was a kind of company, it was an ITV News there was messaging um, from our head of news gathering, Andrew Dagnall, to say, you know, this is a story that we really want to champion. Um, everyone needs to buy into it. And we, we have never had to fight for it. You know, we've never had to fight to get it on. It's always been, um, you know, and, and that's also, <laughs> as, a, as a news editor, and I'm sure Dan's the same and Sarah's the same, you know, it's, it's quite a rare thing when you're not always having to kind of pitch every piece and go, this is why it deserves, you know, four minutes, or this is why it should be your lead. We haven't really had that challenge um, and, and we're incredibly lucky. But I think it also shows that our newsroom recognised that this was something different. This was something that could set us apart. And this was a real issue that was worth us highlighting because it was so important. Well, one effect of the story was that Croydon Council at last moved Francois into a new flat, even though it was still a temporary one. Let's just have a quick look at that, uh, at that and at Francois' uh, reaction.
I was so scared before I came to you guys like oh my god should I take it to the news should I not I don't know the outcome and I was really afraid of the outcome so I'm so glad that I did because now I'm just like oh the news is actually good <laughs> uh, that's great to hear Sarah were you getting a sense at that stage of how many other similar stories there were to be uncovered I mean, I've always, I think, Dan's been the same with this. I've always been looking at housing. I've always been trying to get housing on the news. I mean, I, I reiterate what Imogen has just said, that I can't pray. I mean, as a freelancer, I can't praise ITV News enough for taking this and running with it like they did. There's, these problems, I mean, in some ways, I think these problems are a reflection of a failing in mainstream news journalism, that it's even got to this extent before we've covered it. Um, you know, these problems are all over the UK and we've known about it for a long time. And I think it's been, previously for me, before ITV News, it's been really hard to get anybody to see that. Um, so I can't, and I'm not trying to suck up to the bosses because anybody who knows me knows I don't suck up to the bosses. Um, but really it, it was just incredible that I was suddenly at a news organisation that was taking it seriously and, and prepared to give airtime to it and go back to it again and again and again. So I kind of already knew that these stories were out there. My, my problem prior to this was getting them on the telly and getting editors um, to actually take people's problems seriously. Um, Daniel, uh, the story and the follow-ups were clearly making waves. What sort of response were you getting from the authorities, both local and national? Well, the, the, the first week was really dominated by Croydon's reaction and Croydon's response, which was um, the, kind of the, the, the anger that Franzoi and Leroy had, I think, initially of, of being forced to live there and not being listened to, was then exacerbated by the fact that they were so quick to respond to us. And they were quick to put up an interview, for, for, uh, the council for interview. They launched an inquiry. The regulator of social housing launched an inquiry. And suddenly this kind of whole establishment kicked into gear and it, because we were there. And, and that, that, for me, and I, I know it's, we've, I've been to Franz about this before, that made, it, that made it feel even worse because it was like, I've been saying this for months and no one cared. And yet it takes ITV to do it. So, so initially we had that sort of local response from Croydon. And then as we did more and more reports, I have to say on the whole, and there's a, there's a couple of exceptions here, most councils, most housing associations are pretty defensive initially. When we go, they very, very rarely sort of put their hands up and say there's a problem here. The, the odd ones do. But on the whole, I think we sort of knew we were onto a problem because as a journalist, your kind of spider sense is sort of prickle when you know that someone's getting defensive. And that's what was happening a lot. We were getting a lot of defensive responses. In terms of the government response, we're still kind of really waiting for it. But um in terms of kind of the housing sector and local and local councils, housing associations, they very much knew that we were on to them, we were on to something. Um, um, so within about a week, the Parliamentary Housing Committee was on the case and they were questioning the leader of Croydon Council about their lack of action. Let's take a quick look at how ITV were covering that. Inside this South London tower block, families lived for months in the most unimaginable squalor. Ignored and ignored by their landlord, Croydon Council, who admitted sending repair teams in, but failing to get the residents out. Today, in Parliament, the council leader faced questions from MPs on how it was allowed to happen. A report from ITV News uh, about a particular block of flats in Regina Road, which I think we described as the worst block of flats, uh, flats in, in the United Kingdom. Perhaps you'd like to say something about that report. I've said um, uh, elsewhere how sorry I am. This was a complete corporate failure, as you highlight, to understand what was happening. My worry is that there is a, a bigger, more systemic issue at play here. I think we can all uh, hear from the Grenfell residents how they reported problems over and over and over again and weren't listened to. I absolutely share that's of um, great concern to me. Watching that from the hotel room the council has placed her in, Franzoy, who was forced to endure those appalling conditions with her two children for over four months. She is the head of the council and I've been reporting this to the council for too long for her to not know about it. Then she's clearly not doing her job properly. Within three weeks the damp was coming and I contacted them 
and they said it was my fault. Croydon Council says it wants tenants to come forward with housing issues, but Yasmin has been telling them for five years about the mould and damp in her one-bedroom flat she lives in with her two children. Is that, is that where you sleep? This is where I sleep. So you've got to put a bed in the living room? So, yep, yeah, buy myself a bed. She says repair teams come in and they simply wash the mould off and tell her to open more windows before it comes back within days. It's gone all over their clothes. There's always water on the floor. I just recently had to buy them new beds because it went all over the wood and on the mattresses. And then it went all over the floor, so I had to put a new flooring down. There's not a lot of space. There's no space at all. Have you sort of given up the idea of getting somewhere else? Yeah, I literally have. have I've you? literally given up. The council says they've recently made repairs on the flat, including new fans to fix ventilation issues, but that took five years. And while an inquiry is now underway into what happened in this block of flats, the council has admitted they simply don't know how many people are living in similar conditions. Daniel Hewitt, News at 10, Croydon. Um, Imogen, how was ITV News looking at this story now? So w was everybody on board and determined to keep things going? Because I know it's only a a small team, isn't it? I know one of them, Sophie Alexander, was doing great work through all of this. Um, so uh, how were the team uh, coping with this? Um, I mean, I think we were coping well. I mean, I'd like to say that. <laughs> but I guess the truth is, you know, we were, we were busy. You know, we were, we were swamped with people contacting us. Um, we brought in, you know, we're really lucky at ITV News to have a lot of talented young journalists um, in our newsroom who were putting their hands up to help us you know it's kind of as you as every newsroom has with a big story it's um everyone in the mix so we had you know Amy and Will and Rachel and, and loads of other um young journalists because the thing that is um both challenging and really rewarding with the story is that you know we need to talk to every individual who calls us or emails us we need to check their story out we need to go and visit them um, and that's a lot of that's a lot of time and effort, you know, which is what we have to do and what we should do because we need to meet people, we need to see their houses for ourselves, we need to get a sense of the story. So, you know, it was very much how how many people can we bring into it, um, how many people can we steal from different parts of the newsroom uh, and get them to really become, you know, in in a way it was we kind of became housing caseworkers and and. We don't want to, you know, we can't take that role on ourselves. Um, but that's what it's like because you have to know the background to how they got there. You have to know how the council or the housing association responded. You have to get into the legals of it. You know, this this is whilst we have great pictures and and you know really strong people that we speak to, like Franzoy, you know, there's also a legal element to this. You know, we have to check everything out, we have to um, you know, cross all cross all our T's and dot the I's. Um, so yeah, but the newsroom was very forthcoming and, you know, giving us resource, you know, Sophie Alexandra, as you mentioned, you know, she's with us full time at the moment as a housing producer, we have Sarah, um, you know, anyone else I can <laughs> scramble off the roster to help. Um, so yeah, there was definitely, there was definitely the will for us to have that manpower. Dan, you were traveling the country, finding these stories or reporting on, on, on stories. I mean, when you look at the pictures, and we're going to have a look at, uh, at some of those reports, extracts from them in a, in a minute, were you getting more and more amazed by what you were seeing? Yeah. You, and, and as a reporter, and this is purely as a, I'm saying this purely as a reporter, when you put a report out like the first one, like when you see Franzoy's place and you speak to Franzoy and, you, and Leroy, the the bar for shock just goes so high that you kind of wonder whether you'll ever go over it again and actually was quite quickly what we realized and sarah made this point really well early which is that there are people living in really really poor conditions all over this country and they have been for a really long time and so it very quickly dawned on me that though not everyone and let's be clear franzo's life was in danger living in that flat with her two boys let's not forget that a lot of people are living in really really poor conditions so yeah very quickly realized that we, this was not a kind of one-off and though some tried to and some in the government tried to sort of kept saying that Croydon was an extreme case we quickly realized it wasn't an extreme case um, at all and actually the, the, the point that Imogen made about the team and it, the one big thing about the team and everyone got on board this really quickly was this was a different type of story we have a real we have a real duty of care to everyone we speak to but on this story in particular there's there's just nothing more vulnerable than letting someone into your home and film how you're living and film your children and I think we were I was we were all were but me particularly on the ground going into these homes was very 
keen to make sure that they understood that we got that, that this wasn't just a news story for us. This is something we were doing. And I think that people, the, the case studies, as we call them, sort of bought into that very quickly, that we they realised we weren't just doing this for a news piece, then we were going to move on. Yeah. Okay, let's have a look at some of the extracts from those stories that you were um, covering in this, this sort of period. Uh, and also including a little look at how you're explaining how difficult it is for housing tenants to get action uh, when they really do have a problem. The ceiling's about to collapse. It's gonna collapse. It's going she to warned her landlord it would happen. Can you see this? This is crazy. But as Nicole Walters stood in her living room yesterday morning, no, 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 no. Panicking and powerless to the water dripping down her walls and through her ceiling came the consequences of the council's inaction. For four years, Nicole has reported leaks in her flat to Southwark Council, telling them only two weeks ago she feared for the safety of her and her seven-year-old son. What if my son was here? My son could have been sleeping there. My son, that's his favourite spot. And I'm tired of complaining. I just want a permanent place for me and my son to be able to call home. So obviously this is my bedroom. As you can see, the, this is where I don't want to sleep with all the damp. In Newquay, 37-year-old Julie Roberts is no longer able to wash the mould off the ceilings and the walls she's privately rented for seven years. Last year I was diagnosed with lung cancer, brain, liver. Last week I was diagnosed with uh, on my bladder um, and half my lungs collapsed now. The problem began eight years ago. Black mould covering the walls in the bedrooms where Sherry and her four children sleep. Her seven-year-old, Skylar, sleeps in a tent on top of her bed to try to avoid it. Some of them are complaints going back to 2015. Sherry has complained continuously to Clarion, her housing association. Mould in bathroom, 2015, mould. They've washed the mould off ten times, but despite that, it always comes back. My kids are used to it. As bad as it is, this is like the normal for them. How sad's that? They've got the world in front of them and they only know mould and throwing away their stuff. That's it. First, there's the housing ombudsman, but council and housing association tenants aren't allowed to complain directly themselves. They must first go through a designated person, an MP or a local councillor, who lodge a complaint on their behalf. For tenants in the private sector, there's no legal obligation on their landlord to even sign up to the housing ombudsman. It's voluntary. Then there's another body, the Local Government and Social Care Ombudsman. They also deal with housing complaints. And then there's another, the Regulator for Social Housing. But they will only deal with complaints where there is serious detriment to residents. So in the whole of 2019-20, they investigated just 143 cases. <laughs> Next to the machines that help Junior breathe grows black mould that makes it harder. His bedroom is covered in it. So too is the bedroom where his 24-hour carer sleeps. With a neuromuscular condition, the 29-year-old cannot walk and can barely talk. The care staff hired to help him also spend their time wiping down the walls of his mould-infested South London flat. In Bristol, Terry's trying to raise two young children in this. This is where it all started. There's mould and damp everywhere in their two-bedroom flat. She's decorated three times in three years and has now had to nail the wallpaper to the wall to stop it falling down. Why has it taken ITV News to get involved here for you guys to start taking action? Clearly that shouldn't be happening. You know, clearly if a customer is reporting something to us, we should be following it up. But why has no one been round? Why has no one bothered to just turn up at her flat and take a look at what she's telling you? Yeah, and that is unacceptable. Could you live in a property like that? No. Um, Francois, is that how it seemed to you that after years of your complaints being ignored, the, the involvement of journalists suddenly miraculously changes everything? Yeah, um, that is exactly how it is. Um, you'll be ignored on countless occasions until you get a journalist and the news involved and then just like that, you get an immediate response. And that's one of the reasons why I even want to go into journalism now, like, um, because I want to help people and the, clearly the only way 
you can help people is by using the power you have in journalism to take on the people that they can't that don't want to respect them and don't want to listen to them and want to abuse them so this is where journalism come in and they they have the power to take action against these people and fix the wrong that they put in place yeah sarah this feeling of helplessness that no one cares about you runs through nearly all of these stories You've helped a lot of tenants fight to get action from the authorities. Uh, tell us about how it all changes when a journalist gets involved. It seems a terribly cynical position for authorities to take. Really cynical. Um, but Franco, you make my heart sing with joy when you talk about journalism as being something that is not just about making films and telling stories, but is about helping people. Because um, I really feel that we have a duty as journalists, not just to make reports, but to actually help people because we do have power. And, and, and I think it goes across the board. This is not just about housing. Um, this kind of people being ignored, that don't have a lot of power, might not have a lot of money, um, you know, mental health care, special educational needs. I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm sure there are people out there that, you know, are trying to get a place in the school for their child, can't get one, no one's listening, everyone's ignoring them. And over the course of my extended career, because I'm no longer young, um, you know, I've seen it happen thousands of times where I'll just put a call into a press office and ask for confirmation of X, Y, or Z and this person's problem is solved. So it really does seem now, cynical or not, that the only thing um, authorities are frightened of or aware of is exposure um, and the fear that we as national news journalists might be able to expose them. Um, it, it, it never used to be like this. I've been a journalist over 20 years. It really didn't used to be like this, but I think one of the things that's happened in the past 10 or 15 years probably due to austerity, is these jobs now are no longer, um, you know, like these frontline jobs that people thought, oh, we don't really need that, we can make a cut there. These people are no longer picking up the phone, so it's left to us to do it. Six weeks or so after that first News at 10 story, the independent report into Croydon Council's housing policy was published, and it was, not surprisingly, very damning. Let's take a look at how ITV News covered that. They were described as the worst homes in Britain. The damp, dangerous disrepair ITV News found in these flats in South London, putting the lives of residents at risk. That's the conclusion of a damning inquiry, which found the landlord Croydon Council incompetent, uncaring and chronically short-staffed, with a poor culture that stigmatised tenants and ignored them for four years, leading to this. It's, I just feel like I'm going to kill myself if I continue like that, so... Franzoy was left to live in it with her two young sons. Now in her new home, she says those responsible should lose their jobs. You can't just treat people like that and do that to another human being and expect to get away with it. Do you worry they are going to get away with it, as you put it? They are going to get away with it because who's going to hold them accountable? The report, commissioned following our investigation, found a lack of capacity and competence at Croydon Council. Tenants stigmatised by staff as demanding, difficult and less worthy of respect. Senior managers do not appear to know what is going on and failed in their duty to keep tenants safe. Today, Croydon Council accepted the findings of the report in full. Absolutely. Clearly what happened, which the investigators have observed for us, was unacceptable. And it's shocking that our council residents came to you to present those cases to us rather than coming to us. That shows the well, change we've got. They did come Indeed, to indeed. We ignore them. Yes, yes, absolutely, again. absolutely. And that, that's what I want to change. There's been no sign of anyone being sacked, anyone losing their jobs. The fact is no one's taking responsibility in your council for what's happened here. I don't accept that at all. As council leader, I have commissioned this report. We have a, a, um, a clear action plan about how we're going to respond to all of those recommendations. The mushroom comes from it. What, in the war? It's not but it's still war. happening in Croydon what? today. Constant leaks in Riziki's kitchen have caused this. We remove this all the time. This is a mushroom. Well, these are mushrooms. Riziki lives here with his wife and children opposite Franzoy's former block and has complained to the council about water damage and damp for two years. We pay for this. I told them, I pay. 
Can you help? We need the help. I have a key in the house. Croydon Council told us the necessary repairs have now been booked in here, but admitted tonight they still don't know how many others are living in conditions like this. Daniel Hewitt, News at 10, Croydon. Um, Frontside, did you feel strongly that somebody should have been held more personally accountable um, when the uh, results of that report were published? Sorry? Did you feel that somebody should have been held personally accountable? It, to be blunt, that somebody should have lost their job uh, because of what that report found? Yes, I do believe so, because um, a lot of tenants have complained to Croydon Council, have complained to their designated um, repair team, and we was all ignored, and they were well aware of the situation. They were well aware of each complaint. They had photographs. So they knew exactly what was happening and they nevertheless they, we was all ignored and no one was held accountable for it. Uh, Imogen, were you still getting a lot of housing stories coming into you uh, th at this sort of time and were you able to follow up all or most of them? Yeah, we're still getting a lot. We were still getting a lot. We are still getting a lot. Um, we try and we answer everyone um, and we have a kind of a system for saying, you know, send us photos, we'll log your... Um, will log your issue um, and you know obviously there's a huge range in what people come to us with um, and you know being blunt you know we need to go for the ones that are the most dramatic that you know need help urgently or need coverage urgently um, but because we're constantly working on different stories and different themes you know there might be something that we can't cover that week but we think okay well actually that's an issue that we didn't know about and we might need to do that in a few weeks or, or that works um, you know for this piece um, and the people that we visit and that we, you know, can't film with, we have to let down um, and, you know, try and point another direction. So it is, it is really difficult um, in deciding who we film with and, and who takes precedence, really. Well, 10 days after that independent report was published, there was actually a meeting of Croydon Council and Francois herself was given the opportunity of addressing it. And as you'll see, she didn't pull any punches at all. To be quite honest, none of the tenants in Croydon trust anybody in the council because as far as they're concerned, you're all for yourself. And none of you want to hear what's going on with them. None of you want to even step out and help them and see what is going on in their community. This is your community. You can help us to rebuild this community, make it better for everybody. This is not one's worth. This is not Lambeth, this is Croydon Council, we all live here, we're all a part of it, this is our community. So why does the tenants and the residents of Croydon Council has to be sitting down and living in squalors, being ignored? Okay. Practically, it's like yeah. you guys put them in homes and say you might as well go commit suicide because we don't really give a because we've done our jobs already, we've housed you, we put a roof at your head and that's it, we've put the files in the archives and that's that. And you move on to the next person and you do the same thing to the next person and the next person and the next person and, the, and it's just ongoing and when does it stop? Uh, Franzo, did you get the impression that people there were listening and taking notice? Um, I believe there's a lot of actors in trade and council, so, you know, poker faces. <laughs> did, did you feel better having said what you said? Yes, I did feel better expressing how I felt. Good. Uh, okay, Sarah, you were still uncovering more appalling housing conditions not too far away from uh, that original flat uh, in South London. Uh, it was clear that it wasn't just councils that were involved as well, it was housing associations too. Uh, tell us a little bit about the Eatfield Estate and how you heard about it. You, Sarah. I think, um, given that this is a masterclass, that this story, the Eastfield Estate story, shows two things. Um, firstly, someone tweeted this. I hadn't seen the original tweet, but then somebody who must have known I was a journalist covering housing linked me in to the tweet. And I'm, I'm really not a proponent of picking up stories off Twitter and Facebook. However, I'm not knocking it either, because that's how it came to me. But the other thing that it demonstrates 
I think, is uh, so I rang the person who was doing the original tweet and I went down there and put feet on the ground. And I, I just cannot emphasize enough how much feet on the ground matter. And um, you just can't get a picture from a telephone call. It, you just have no idea. And physically, when you're in an environment, and um, the same goes for Regina Road, Dan alluded to it before that we went up the tower block and we knocked on every door. And ITV have given me a long time to go around houses, knocking on doors, not knowing whether there's a story there or not. So I physically went down to that estate and walked around with the residents and knocked on doors. And as soon as we'd done that, spent a few hours doing that, we realized, um, you know, there was another sort of big story here. Um, and I wish more news organizations would do it. And if there are any editors who watch this, um, pay attention because you're missing really important stories by not allowing your journalists to go out and spend time talking to people. So there. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Um, okay, let's have a look at uh, ITV's story on um, Eastfield. For almost 50 years, families of this South London suburb have called the Eastfields estate their home. But time has not been kind. And inside these three-storey blocks, owned and managed by Britain's biggest housing association, their tenants feel as tired and neglected as the crumbling buildings they're forced to live in. Mum of three, Juliet Arthur, and her husband work three jobs between them to afford the £1,300 a month clarion housing charge to live in this. This is where the hall is. Oh, wow. That's how you left it. A leak in her living room she first reported in June 2020 went unfixed, so in November the ceiling caved in, inches from where her son was doing schoolwork. Imagine having your child sitting there under a roof and it just dropped. And my children, the little one came, Mommy, the roof has come down. Do you worry about their safety when you're not here? Every day. Seven months on, the hole remains, and the leak has plunged the house into darkness. None of the lights upstairs have worked since November, including the children's bedroom. My mum keep on calling them, and they're not like messaging or calling, saying, oh, um, we're going to be coming. Yeah. No, they don't. No. On the other side of the estate, Janet is working two jobs to pay for a clarion flat that is falling apart. She shows us the squalor that is her rotting, broken bathroom and the kitchen where she cooks for her family crumbling around her. The ceilings covered in mould, the walls full of holes. She's had to fill in herself to keep out a growing infestation of mice. And the mouse come from this hole. What, well, the mouse come through here? Yeah. The mouse so what's come the, is this cement? Yeah, it's a cement. It's Did a you do this? Yeah, I do it. What is that? It's a hole. What's, why is there a hole there? I don't know. When I come here, what's here? So it's been like that for 27 years? Yes. Have you told them about the problems in here? I, I told them. I told them. So they don't care. They don't care. Janet isn't the only tenant to report a rodent problem to Clarion. Eastfield's residents shared with us video after video of mice and rats in their kitchens, their bedrooms and their bathrooms. Clarion has promised to regenerate this estate and move tenants into new properties, but the dozens of tenants we spoke to in the two weeks we spent here say that promise was first made six years ago and still no one has been moved. Maria and Christopher have lived here for nearly 30 years. They've watched the estate fall deeper into disrepair. A leak in the corridor is the latest in a long line of problems, but their biggest worry is in the hallway. Christopher's disability makes it difficult for him to walk and he keeps tripping over these broken tiles. They're not still all that bothered about getting repairs and jobs done. They don't seem to care about the tenants, as long as they get the rent money every month. The Clarion, who obviously run the place here, yeah. their chief executive earns uh, £350,000 a year. That's her salary. What for? Well, get her to live in these places and see how she likes it. Not being nasty. What are they doing for that money? What are they doing? Clarion told us their chief executive's pay is in line with other organisations of a similar size. Why have so many Clarion tenants been left to live in Eastfields in such 
squalor for so many years. Getting the balance right between how much you spend in the short and the long term on an estate that ultimately has come to the end of its life is difficult. I'm absolutely clear that we have not got the balance right on the Eastfields estate and I'd like to apologise on behalf of Clarion to all of those residents. When, when was the last time you went to Eastfields? So I haven't been to Eastfields for, you know, over the last year because of the pandemic. But, but, I am but you're here today. You're, in, you're, I'm, in, a, you're I'm, in a room with me today. I'm here today and I am so going to be... I'm going to be part of the team that goes out and knocks on every single residence door. Tenants think that you think they aren't important. They complain for years and nothing really gets fixed. Then we turn up and we contact you and suddenly things start to get fixed. And they look at that and they think, oh no, we were right, we don't matter to them. They're right, aren't they? I and the senior management team are completely committed to putting in extra resources on this estate to get this right. These homes may have reached the end of their life, but their replacements haven't even started being built. In the meantime, residents fear their suffering will continue to be met with silence. Dan, most people understand that housing associations are not-for-profit bodies supposedly working for the good of their members in other words the tenants the, themselves were they actually any better than local councils do you think or worse in some way uh great question and probably how long have you got uh i think there's there's uh, there's a debate within the housing sector about if housing associations have sort of lost their way slightly and that's sort of a really complicated question of of whether they would argue that they've tried to kind of make up for the fact the government have basically stopped building council houses by trying to build their own by building their own they've sort of focused too much on building new homes and not enough on maintaining the ones they've got they would argue differently but the, the one thing i would say that sort of sums up both social housing and well social housing council and housing association the one thing i found going around is the sort of sense of gratitude is that sense of we, you've got a council house you've got a you've got a social house there are so few of them left that there was that there are that the stock has been dwindled has dwindled over the years and so they end up in a council house or temporary housing or social housing and it's like you can complain and complain and complain but sort of subconsciously the housing association or the council know really they're not going to leave because they're not going to go back into private rent that's why they're in social housing in the first place it, there's no other choice but to stay and so there's sort of that sense quite a dangerous conclusion that actually they're sort of subconsciously not fixing problems very fast because they know they're not going anywhere and that's a really dangerous position to sort of find yourself in i think if, if we're coming to the conclusion that people should be grateful that's my dog barking should be grateful then that's pretty dangerous i'll mute myself and shut my dog up <laughs> okay one last uh, extract to show now before we have a sort of final wrap-up dis discussion another piece by dan about housing associations and the growing understanding that while they are not for profit their chief executives look after themselves pretty well. Now, the National Housing Federation, the body behind England's 800 leading social housing providers responsible for six million tenants, has admitted their sector has failed. Your investigation has revealed stories that are just completely unacceptable. Um, I want to say sorry to those residents. They deserve better. Sorry seems to be the easiest word when it comes to housing associations when we approach them. Why does it take us, our intervention, for you to do something about this? I know some members are investing more money. I know members are reviewing their complaints processes. It should never take a, an ITV News investigation to get action on a repair. But across the country, an increasing number of social housing tenants are not happy with how they're being treated. Figures obtained by ITV News show the housing ombudsman received more than 7,300 complaints about housing associations this year. That's up 35% in three years. That's as they've been making more and more money. Their overall income has doubled in just over a decade, from £10 billion to £21 billion last year. And more money has meant bigger salaries. The top 10 housing associations set up to house people on low incomes now pay their bosses up to £436,000 a year. In 2020, chief executives of the biggest companies took home on average £340,000. Do you not worry that people are living with damp and mould and ceilings collapsing and constant leaks and rodent problems, but yet their CEO earns £400,000? thousand pounds a year when it comes to chief exec salaries this is not something that that i set you have no personal opinion on whether you think can they justify that salary i i think these salaries are they're not set by me they're set by independent boards
We asked the top 10 associations for an interview. They all declined. With the national shortage of affordable homes, their role has never been more important. But too many of their tenants have been left to feel like they are not. OK, we've seen only a part of the remarkable series of stories on this subject that ITV News has done and continues to do after a good four months working on it. Um, I want to just ask uh, each of the panellists a uh, final question, really. Sarah, you mentioned earlier on this issue about, uh, to, to some extent, this being remarkable because it hasn't been reported on much by mainstream media. Uh, I mean, you and I have talked about one of the factors in this being the disappearance of strong and well-funded local media. Do you think that's a, a factor? I think it definitely is one of the factors. I don't think it's the only factor. Um, although local, I mean, every story is a local story. This, this idea that national stories, local stories, every story is a local story. And it's up for us, it's up to us as journalists if we find a local story to then find the national elements of it, which will surely be there. Um, I think the other problem is um, journalism has become incredibly elitist. And so to get stories like this, we know, me, Imogen and Dan know as journalists, if we ring up and we've got a query or a complaint or a problem, we will get dealt with with professionalism, courtesy, respect, because we're journalists and we, and we know that. But I, I think the elitism of journalism and the um, issue with local papers, there's, there's two issues at work, not just one. Um, Imogen, at what point with a story like this does ITV say, finally, we've done all we're doing on this and we're going to move on and leave it for now? Never. <laughs> Literally hopefully, never. hopefully never. It hasn't happened yet. Um, and I'm praying it won't yet. So, you know, fingers okay. crossed. I mean, of course, every story has its has its wind down and, you know, we have points in the year where we revise on things. I think I think we were also really lucky that we did start this at the beginning of the year and at a time where people were um, really exhausted by COVID coverage. And I also, thinking about it, think that because we'd all been trapped in our homes for so long, that when we covered housing and the housing that Fransoy and Leroy and others had been living in, not only for four years, but during lockdown, they'd been stuck in these places. I also think that helped us and that helped with our timing that it kind of cut through, um, especially. So I haven't had any uh, messages from my newsroom yet about stopping. And in fact, you know, we have conversations about staffing and they're still very supportive. So um, fingers crossed, talk to me in a year. Okay. Um, Daniel, uh, what lessons do you think there are in this story for young journalists? Who might be watching and just to pick up on, on Sarah's point I think we're all aware that more and more journalism is done from a desk staring at a screen this has been the absolute opposite of that it's been out on the streets knocking on doors seeing what life is like for real, for real people do you worry that less of that is happening now and what what should we telling uh, young journalists now yeah, it's a really good question, and, and, and I can give a sort of um, a kind of ideal answer, uh, but, but I know for a lot of young journalists it's hard. You've got to try and get on the ladder, you've got to try and earn some money, you've got to get that, that freelance shift. The first job you're going to get is unlikely to be on an investigations unit. I think actually my advice would be if you've got, an in, you've got a hunch for a story or you've got a passion for a story, make that known to your bosses, raise it with people, raise it with your line manager, raise it with people around you. If you've got an idea or you've got an area you think, you know what, I think that's really important. ITV News, I have to say I've only worked for ITV, but ITV News has always been a place I've found you can go to people around you and say, I've got this idea. Now, look, as a young journalist coming in, I first rung on the ladder, they're not going to put you on telly and let you do it straight away, but they, they'll you, if you are supported correctly by people around you, they should embrace your idea and look into it. And you first can maybe shadow on a story and a reporter can, I had ideas at the start of my career where I watched other reporters do it and I watched them do it and I learned from it. Um, but as I'd say, we got to your point of when, when you sort of stop, I've, uh, sorry, your point about um, local journalism, I think actually part of this is there's a role to play for ITV and BBC and Sky to sort of be brave and have faith in reporters. And if they bring in a story, let them give them time to work on this stuff because if we don't do it no one's going to do it even <laughs> investigations take teams and they take time and if you turn in a report like croydon straight away your managers should say right give this team time and resource because they're obviously going to keep delivering stuff like that 
Uh, I want to leave the last word to Francois. Um, since that first meeting with Sarah, you've seen a lot of journalism in, in action and you've started to take some steps in the media yourself. What's been your overall impression of the way that journalism has worked in your case, Francois? Uh, you're muted. Just unmute yourself. Sorry. Okay. Um, so before I did the news clip, um, my views on journalism was not um, very good because um, it was more they just take their story and leave the poor vulnerable person behind to still struggle through whatever their situation is. But um, with ITV, they changed my view completely of journalism because um, even though after they exposed my story, they still stayed with me and um, were still interested and wanting to know um, what's happening with the council, are they going to rehouse me, what is the situation? And um, for me, that really was a wow moment because I did not think for a second that um, they would have stayed after they got their news clip. So that was, that, and that for me, that is what journalism should be because um, when you take someone's story and they're going through their situation, they've, they've, there's a lot of stress and mental health problems that's going on. And then to go to the news and try to get help there from journalism, from journalists, and um, they take your story and take you on board and you and trust, you put trust in them. Um, it's good that they stay with you and they help you through the situation. Even if they can't physically help you, it's good to at least stay in contact to know what is happening with the situation and are you happy with everything we've done for you? Uh, well said, uh, Francois. Um, it's interesting, I noticed that somebody was saying on Twitter while the session was on that it was an amazing showcase for public service broadcasting, which it, it, it absolutely is. And I think at a time when surveys show supposedly that people are losing some faith and some trust in public service broadcasting on various channels, um, it's a fantastic way to remind people that it really can do wonderful things for, for people who are, in, uh, uh, who are in need of help. Um, so thank you so much to everybody for, uh, for listening tonight. Thank you so much to our participants, to Francois, to Sarah, to Daniel uh, and to Imogen. Uh, thanks to my colleagues at the John Schofield Trust, particularly Tristan Maris for his invaluable help with this session. And thanks to, to all the Trust's friends, supporters and donors. Uh, and again, thanks for watching and we will see you soon. Good night.